So welcome to everyone as you're joining and getting connected. I will just wait a couple more minutes to allow everyone else to join and get settled and then we'll begin. We see a few more people popping on, so we'll give it a few more seconds. It's like that uh, bag of popcorn in the microwave, uh, just kind of waiting for it to peter out. And, uh, it's Maybe I'll just do a quick check with the people I can see. My Is my uh, volume okay? Am I coming across all right? A few nods will do. Perfect. <coughs> Okay, well, I think we'll get started, and, and those that join uh, will join uh, partway in. Just give me a moment here. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our April session of Alberta Skills. So as you can see, today's session is titled Returning to Your Rural Community, Expected and Unexpected. I'll be your facilitator today, Jason Doust. Uh, I'm a physiotherapist with Alberta Health Services and the professional practice lead for the North Zone. Uh, as always, we have two exciting presenters today. But before I introduce them, uh, we'll go through our usual housekeeping items. Uh, so first, I just want to remind everyone of the availability of the Rehab Advice Line. Um, the service is available to all Albertans um, to access physiotherapy and occupational therapy experts. Uh, to <clears throat> help address your rehabilitation concerns and wayfinding rehabilitation services. Excuse me. I'll also just read through our disclaimer <clears throat> that the information contained in these webinars and related materials is not a substitute for, for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please contact your medical practitioners for more information and to see what is right for you. This webinar is being recorded and will be made publicly accessible. Uh, our housekeeping items, just to remind you, uh, everyone will be muted for the uh, bulk of the presentation. Uh, today's structure will be a short presentation followed by uh, breakout rooms where we can have smaller groups dis discussion. Um, that's where everyone will be invited to share their, their input and share some of their experiences. Um, and, and please feel free to turn on your cameras and unmute your microphones at that point. Um, then when we return to a larger group, we will open it up to a, a larger group uh, question and answer period. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions or things to say, feel free to use the chat box to enter those items. Uh, and then we will either come back to them in the smaller group, if it makes sense there, or perhaps when we get back to the larger group discussion. Uh, you can also use the chat box if you are having any issues, uh, technological issues, and uh, some of the people online will offer some assistance. Uh, during the presentation, there will be some polls uh, presented to you on your screen. Uh, please just, you know, once we present the question, just select the most appropriate answer for each of these poll questions. Uh, on screen, uh, you can change your name and keep your video off during the webinar. That is up to you. And again, a final reminder, we do record the webinar and post it to the Spinal Cord Injury Alberta YouTube page uh, for future access. Um, I will remind everyone that we are uh, running an evaluation uh, with our sessions. Um, so later in the presentation, we will present a link for people to 
uh, open up the evaluation and complete it based on today's presentation. Um, when you complete the evaluation, you can be entered in a draw. Um, and today is the last day that we'll be running the evaluation. So today you'll be entering your name uh, in the draw for a tablet. Um, prior to this, uh, last month's uh, presentation, uh, our winner was Daniel Dornicamp. I think I said that right, apologies if I didn't. Uh, so Daniel, you won a gift card uh, and you'll also be entered in the larger draw for the tablet computer as will everybody who has completed evaluations in the past. So today will be your last opportunity to complete the evaluations and enter that tablet draw. Uh, like I said, we'll share the link to that evaluation later. So with that said, uh, we'll take a, a brief moment here for our first two polls. Uh, so on your screen, uh, just please select the most appropriate answers uh, just so we can learn a little bit more about our audience. And Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm happy to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, I'll introduce you to Ashton Iliak. Ashton is an occupational therapist currently working with Alberta Health Services on the North Zones Complex Care Team. Ashton is a veteran therapist in the North Zone, having worked in rural communities, providing care in support of living, outpatient services, acute care units, continuing care and home care. Her broad experience has given her the opportunities to work with clients in various transitions and to provide services in the home, the community, and our AHS facility. Outside of work, Ashton is busy with her spouse raising three children in Fort McMurray. She also volunteers as president of the board of directors for Hope Haven, a women's shelter, and is an advocate for victim services through the RCMP. Uh, we're also lucky to have Melissa Jansen with us today. Uh, Melissa is also an occupational therapist working on the same team as Ashton. Uh, Melissa also boasts a career focused in rural practice, serving clients across the sectors and transitions. Now you might recognize Melissa from a brief but glamorous pajama model career as a teenager. Although this career was limited to a single flyer, it was memorable nonetheless. Uh, so Janessa is here today to assist with uh, supporting our breakout rooms later. Uh, but, you know, she may join the conversation um, if she needs. Uh, secondly, we are joined by Keisha Mastrodimos. Uh, Keisha is a 24-year-old C5, C6, incomplete quadriplegic from Grand Carriers. Uh, Keisha's injury was a result of a car accident, uh, car versus moose. Uh, Keisha is now in a third year of psychology, working part-time, and just trying to live life to the fullest amongst, amidst the COVID chaos. Um, please know you can follow Keisha and her journey on her YouTube channel, Keisha, Keisha Master Venus, or on Facebook, um, Keisha's Road to Recovery. So with that, I will turn the presentation uh, over to Ashton, uh, who will tell us about how OT prepares for and supports the transition home for people following spinal cord. Thank you, Jason. And I wanna thank everyone for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna to start with what is OT? OTs help solve problems that interfere with a person's ability to do things that are important to them every day. These things may include uh, self-care, for example, getting dressed, eating, and moving around the house. Another one is being productive, if that's going to work or school or participating in, within the community. And last is leisure activities, such as sports, gardening, social activities, or any hobbies that an individual might have. So for the role in, for, sorry, for the role of OT in supporting transitions, these transitions can include from Edmonton to a rural hospital while waiting for the Glenrose, or it can be once completed rehab at the Glenrose and returning straight to community or to a rural hospital. Everyone's journey is a little bit different. Um, questions such as what, what to be prepared for. Um, equipment and home modifications are typically the largest barrier to returning home. 
transportation can also be a barrier for some of our clients. And the last thing we're going to touch on for the presentation today is just the challenges of rural practice and settings. So keeping in mind that every therapist has a different level of experience, resources and supports, and rural settings are quite diverse. No, seem, no two seem to be the same. Some limitations can be the resources available and within the hospital setting. Limited staffing ratios and a lack of proper paperwork. Um, sorry, I think someone's off me. <laughs> Uh, sorry, limited staffing ratios and a lack of proper equipment to carry forward with treatment along with personal care and mobility are large limitations to many, many settings. Our settings within the rural hospitals are also mixed units, which leads to further difficulties uh, with meeting high rehab needs between the allied health teams and the nursing staff. Thanks, Ashton. Um... I appreciate that little uh, introduction about what OT does or, or can do. Um, so maybe now we'll pass it over to Keisha and, and she'll just tell us a bit more about what her experience was. Thanks. Uh, so with my experience, um, I was injured in a rural setting. And as soon as I was injured, I was uh, not shipped to, but I was transported to Edmonton to a big city. Um, with being so young and I was actually really sick, um, I couldn't go to Glen Rose right away. So I was actually brought back to Grand Prairie. And when I was in Grand Prairie in the hospital, um, I the nurses didn't teach me anything at all. Um, I kind of just laid in a bed, got changed when I needed to. And then um, that was that. Um, as soon as Glen Rose had a spot for me, I went back to Edmonton for a couple months. And there they taught me... Um, how to be independent, how to do, how to live this new spinal cord injury life and um, what I kind of needed to expect going home and everything. Um, because my house that I was living in, in Sexsmith, what had to get renovated, I had to stay in the hospital until that was done. Um, the house that I was living in, in Sexsmith, as soon as you came to the front door, there was steps going in. And as soon as you got into the door, there were steps going upstairs and downstairs. So that wasn't going to work. So they decided that in my backyard, they were actually going to build an eight foot elevator for me to get in the back door. And then once I was in there, um, we kind of had a main floor and that's kind of where my setup was going to be. So in my bedroom, they ended up putting a ceiling lift in and then putting another ceiling lift in my bathroom. And then they widened the doors as well. Uh, that's kind of the renovations that they had to do with my house. But because it was winter and all the renovations take a lot of time and uh, trying to figure out what to do, that took uh, six months. So I was actually in the hospital for those six months. Um, going from Glen Rose back to uh, Grand Prairie while I waited, that was about four months. Grand Prairie knew absolutely nothing about spinal cord injury. So I was giving them what I learned in Glen Rose which a lot of the nurses didn't have a lot of time for because they had to care to their other patients. So they didn't actually, I didn't get to become very independent at all. I was dependent on their time and what they wanted to do. And so with OT and PT in the hospital, we actually went off YouTube videos. They, they had no idea about uh, quadriplegics and all that. And you know what? It worked. It wasn't the best thing but it worked. Um, when I was going to transition from the hospital back to my house, my parents' house, I had one day that I got to spend in a, I wouldn't even call it an accessible kitchen, but the kitchen that they had downstairs. So with that, I think we spent an hour and we made cookies and basically I couldn't even get to everything. So my OT ended up doing everything. So again, didn't really learn much to go home. And when I got home, I could only go on the main floor. Uh, the kitchen was not set up one bit for me. So I couldn't even help mom uh, in the kitchen to cook dinners, to prep things, to learn anything on my own that the Glen Rose had taught me uh, initially. And my bedroom, same thing. The, just the house was not set up in a 
in a scenario that I could do anything by myself. And as well, when I had OT and PT come visit me in Sexsmith, um, they basically taught me, they just said, be dependent on everybody else. Don't learn how to do anything yourself um, because your muscles, if you do everything yourself, your muscles are going to be weak for the future. So I was like, this is no help. Um, so that entire three years that I was living with my mom and my brothers, they did everything for me. I couldn't even learn how to cook for myself. I couldn't put on my own clothes or anything. Just the house was not set up for me. So it wasn't until I was pushed out uh, by my mother to move out on my own that I was actually able to start living and independently and learning things. And that was chaos, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I learned how to um, cook, clean, sweep, do my laundry um, day by day and by frustration by frustration. Um, also, when I went home from the hospital to my parents' house in Sexsmith, I learned how inaccessible society is and inaccessible sidewalks are and businesses. Like there was some that, oh, I don't think that there was a single uh place in town that had a button uh the street ones that the sidewalks transition down I think were like on the other side of the street so if you needed to get to a business on this side you knew that you had to park over here and yeah that was limited there was very very limited parking there was absolutely no wheelchair accessible parking you just knew where you needed to be um and then I think I wanted to give a little bit of advice of something that I wish I had learned. So be prepared to fail um, and fail a lot. Each time you will learn something, you'll get better each time and see what works best. Um, this life is full of trial and error. Um, when I first moved out on my own, I kept dropping stuff, dropping stuff. And I was like, how is that going to work? And I would try and try new things. In the end, I ended up going to the dollar store and I found a fishnet. So now I just, every time I drop something, I go get my little fishnet and I'm able to pick it up. Um, I really wouldn't change much of my learning, even though it was very, very frustrating, but um, that's how I learned. And yeah, um, yeah, always call ahead to places. It'll save you a headache in the end. Um, it sucks. It's really frustrating that you have to call ahead and make sure something's wheelchair accessible. And just because they say it's wheelchair accessible does not mean it's wheelchair accessible. So yeah, just have a lot of patience, I think. Thanks a lot, Tisha. Um, thanks for sharing all of that. I, I really appreciate your openness and, and your candor. You know, even though as a therapist, there are things that maybe in your story that, you know, make me cringe a little bit hearing about how it happened and, and the experience you went through, but you know, certainly all the better that we, we get to hear that. Um, so, you know, rather than kind of getting into that myself, this is probably a good chance to pause and maybe I'll, I'll hand it to Ashton and, and ask Ashton, are, are there any things that in response to Keisha's story that you'd like to ask her? Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Keisha, I want to ask you a couple of things. Start with, what was your experience with the renovations? And when was the OT actually able to go and do the home assessment? So because my injury was in the winter, which I recommend if anybody can save your getting injured till summer months, is that the OT wasn't able to, yeah, she figured out what we needed, that eight foot elevator, the renovations inside, but to get to the eight foot elevator, we needed concrete to put down. We needed um, the, basically we just needed all the snow to melt and the ground to be tender. I don't think that's the right word, but enough to dig and everything. So yes, we figured out what we needed to do, but we couldn't implement it until it ended up being those six months. And then the concrete, we had absolutely no idea of any resources to go about that. So we ended up just posting to Facebook and having somebody um, offer to do that for us. And yeah, what about your experience? I'm going to ask you one more question. For oh yeah, sorry. Sorry. I just want to know in your role setting, how was it for contractors? Like access to the contractors, what about their experience with renovations? Was that a challenge? Was it a good experience? Kind of what your thoughts are? So throughout the entire injury, throughout the entire renovations and everything, everything 
nothing was professional. They weren't, um, the people that did the concrete, they had never done something like that before. Like just to, I don't know, we just had to get the elevator in line with the um, concrete and I don't know. Yeah, not a very good experience, not very um, professional or knew what they were doing, but it works. It worked out. It just, not a lot of resources, absolutely. That's fair. So I'll lead with that then. Uh, speaking for my experiences, um, being in a rural setting, a lot of it that you're talking about resonates really well with um, the experiences that I had with our clients. Um, so I was practicing in Lacklebish, which is a small community uh, north of Edmonton. And some of our things was, it was different for almost every client coming home. So different problems or challenges, I should say, with each client. So none were really the same. Um, some were in Edmonton and the limitations of seeing the home prior to them coming back to our facility wasn't an option. So we had to wait till they became uh, our clients or our patients, I should say, before we were allowed to actually go access their homes. Uh, so that was one challenge in pre-planning for a client. Um, and then we had very limited contractors to pick from that have had experience with home modifications when we're talking about wheelchair modifications. So again, communities where family members were kind of on the internet and looking for different ideas and contractors that were willing to work with the families. And keeping in mind that you're modifying, you're not building from scratch, you're modifying what you have to work with, right? So that led to even further challenges for a lot of our families and clients and the contractors, really. Uh, so a lot of creativity had to be put into play. <laughs> and on that note, finances. Finances was a huge issue for a lot of our families, a lot of our clients. Uh, we don't plan for these events and it's not an easy, simple fix. So when we're talking about walls being removed and lifts being put in, there's only so many grants to apply for and it doesn't even touch the cost that goes out to the family and the client that they have to endure with this. So I, I think that was a huge issue, uh, obstacle really for a lot of our families and clients and making it suitable. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on is for our clients that were returning to reserve, they faced even further obstacles. So in a few ways, uh, they're federally funded and um, not provincially. So they have, a lot of them have a lack of resources to OT and a lack of RN staffing as well. So in one component, it was really hard to do home visits uh, unless we had permission from the reserve NAHS uh, so that we could actually go and do the home assessment. Uh, the other difficulty was, is coordinating that discharge, a proper discharge from the facility to the reserve, knowing that there wasn't a lot of people to do any handoff with. And in a lot of situations, there was no therapist to discuss this with. So it all fell on the family. So that was, those were huge obstacles for our clients returning uh, to those living arrangements. Um, if, if it was WCB, that was a little bit different, but yeah, I just want to touch on that. And I think the other part, um, yeah, sorry. I think that's, I kind of hit on those pieces. Okay, guys, um, anything else you wanted to ask each other before we moved on? Yeah, Keisha, I want to ask you one more thing because it's something I really noticed with our clients. So I want to know your, your experience and thoughts on it. Is Did you find that you had any issues or challenges losing the, some of the skills that you learned from the Glenrose? 100%. As soon as I got to Grand Prairie, they didn't, I tried to implement the skills that I had been taught, but the nurses staff, the nursing staff just wasn't for it. And they didn't have the time for it to spend individually with me. So yeah, I lost it all. And then again, going back home with mom and everything, I lost it all being dependent on everybody. So absolutely. And, uh, in my experience, I'm happy you touched on that. Cause that was our experience as well. So the for a few different things. What we saw was returning from the Glen Rose, we had uh, limited specialized gyms if we don't have the same equipment that the Glen Rose has. Uh, we also aren't staffed the same way, allied health or nursing staff and 
really the staff isn't really prepared for it either, right? Um, we had no modified kitchen to trial with our clients, so that wasn't even an option in our facility. Our nursing staff are not rehab trained, and so it, they really required a lot of hands-on uh, support, and so did the clients, and just supporting that transition um, overall, right? And I think, to just having the time to actually set aside for the high demand rehab that it requires. Um, I was in a split position, so I only had so many hours to allocate to acute care every day. And I had very limited uh, TA support as well at the time. Um, another thing is we didn't even have a PT half the time. <laughs> so it was uh, OT run the show. <laughs> And uh, I could see it. I could see our clients losing the skills and I could see their frustrations as well because they had learned all these extremely valuable skills at the Glen Rose. And then they come to an environment that we weren't even able to in any way meet what they had learned. And um, it was hard. It was hard to watch the clients go through that frustration as well. And so I think those were just some of the obstacles you touched on, but that in my experience as well, we had the similar experiences in that regard. Thanks, guys. Um, those are those are great questions and some some great conversation. And, you know, maybe some seeds to support uh, some discussion when we do go into our, our breakout rooms. Uh, you know, I'm seeing in the chat box uh, some comments about similar experiences. You know, and not just in a rural setting. You know, people in the city. You know. If, it's not unique to the rural experience. Um, so when we are in our breakout rooms, I, I will invite everyone to kind of share those stories and, and those experiences. Um, before we move on though, I, I will just take a quick second and just clarify for everybody, because um, I, I don't know exactly who's in the audience right now. Um, but when we're talking about hospital staffing, um, you know, when we say nursing staffing, I think people understand. When we say allied health, uh, what we mean is physiotherapists, occupational therapists, our uh, therapy assistants, uh, speech and language pathologists, um, social workers, um, audiologists, respiratory therapists. Um, that, that's not the full list, but that, that's who we're talking about, right? So um, just so that we're clear, you know, in the discussion, when we say allied staff or, or, or nursing staff, that, that's kind of the distinction. Um, and, and then, yeah, Ashton, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, dealing with uh, inconsistent staffing across sites and vacancies. I, I know for a time when you were in Maklavish, uh, you were stuck with me as a physio in another community. Uh, when there was no physio in Maklavish, um, I was going up once a week. So, you know, you'd get me for one day uh, a week um, to try and provide physiotherapy service for, you know, continuing care, acute care, and, and outpatients. So not, not really helpful, but... Yeah, anyway, we won't, we won't dwell on that. Um, we will move on. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll go back to Keisha now. Um, and, and maybe Keisha, you can just elaborate on, you know, some of your, your experiences in, in returning home to uh, Northern Alberta. Yeah, so that kind of, what I mentioned before is kind of the, what I expected. But what I didn't expect is the psychological and emotional stuff that came. Um, when I returned home and I had been living in Sexsmith my entire life, um, coming back home, even in the house or when I was going on walks or attending games and all of that, like sports games, I had every single memory from when I was walking. Every time I turned a corner, there was a street or a park that I used to play on. There was a field that I used to play football on. There was a court that I used to play basketball on. And I remember going to um, my brother's basketball game and sitting in the audience, like cheering him on and all that with my mom. And then I just started crying and I was like, what the heck? And I, it took me a little bit, but um, it was, I, I knew that I would never play again. That I was never going to be able to run across the court and shoot a basketball. And that I had absolutely no, I didn't know that that was going to be a thing. And um, yeah, that, that was really, really hard. Um, I re the transition was so close to my life before that um, I had a hard time deciphering between the two. And it wasn't until I started not really 
yeah, I'm going to say ignoring. I had to avoid the past. I had to avoid looking at pictures from the past because it was way too hard. It was too hard at that moment, but I had to take it in little increments that I had to actually grieve that life that I had before and then start looking. Okay. This is my life now. Um, it's okay. I had to look for the positives. Um, we had damn good parking. Um, just, you had to look for the good things in this life. You couldn't look too far ahead or look too far in the past and get discouraged. Um, and what I found is you got to feel those damn emotions. You got to cry. You got to yell and scream. It's okay to be pissed off. It's okay to be mad that your life before is never going to be the same, that you're pissed off that you have a wheelchair to get around and that you can't get up over the dang, dang curb as easy as somebody else. Um, but yeah, feeling those emotions, not hiding them, not, um, yeah, I think that that, that helped me out a lot. Um, I found that one of the biggest things that you can do for transitioning home and such is get on Aish um, as soon as you can, as soon as you can, because like Ashton was saying, the finances are super, super difficult. So when we were in the hospital, even we started asking about Aish. Um, I'm just going to end mine with just saying something like a little bit of advice. I know I said some, but just putting it into like a little thing here. So do not go home thinking that life is going to be the same as before. It's a new life. You're going to make new memories and embrace and come to peace with the past while slowly finding the good in the new life. Um, and then, like I said, it's okay to be pissed off at the hardships of this new life, but don't dwell. Learn to do everything you could before in a new way. Hope for the best, but prepare, prepare for the worst. You save yourself some disappointment and you may even get lucky and have some appreciation. With that, I mean that when you're going out to restaurants, when you're going out in the public with society, um, prepare that it's not going to be set up for you. Um, in the end, you'll be, you might even be, um, it might surprise you that it actually is, but then you're not disappointed when it's not. Um, the hospital, OT, PT, everything, Glen Rose is all set up for accessibility. Absolutely. So you, you don't actually realize that society isn't set up for you until you actually go out into the reality because you're presented with all this accessibility in those times. Um, hospital, everything set up for you. Don't look. Yeah, I, I think that that that's what I have to put for that. Uh, again, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, especially knowing that you know, it has been emotional, um, emotional experience for you. Um, and I will just say, like as a therapist, it's especially rewarding because you know we don't always get to hear all about those stories, right? We might hear bits and pieces. Um, I know as a physio, it's very easy to get locked into the anatomy and function of, of what people are seeing me about. Um, you know, and it, it, your story just helps as a reminder to me to make sure I take time and ask people about these kinds of experiences and what kinds of feelings they're experiencing and, you know, learning about what they're doing and, and how that's, you know, what, what just exactly how that fits into their journey um, and, and maybe even offer some help where I can. Um, so again, I really appreciate that. Um, I guess likewise, you know, we'll, let's provide the counterpoint and, and kind of go to Ashton and, and just, you know, maybe now Ashton, you can share with us some of your experiences uh, working with clients. Yeah, so from a therapist perspective, I mean, I think um, I have definitely had a lot of my clients um, express those frustrations to myself and it's I'm grateful that they trust me in or to tell me these things because uh, it does help us when we're doing a rehab plan to know that where the frustrations are lying right um, rehab is a lot of pain before you get the gain and a lot of frustrations and a lot of trial and error before we actually get to what we're trying to achieve and so it really helps when our clients let us in and do express those frustrations with us because then we can actually tailor it better because at the end of the day it's all about the client and although we've been taught to do things one way we need to actually accommodate and meet people where they're at so it really helps when people do express these emotions so thank you Keisha because I know it's not easy and especially in a group um so I wanted to talk for just a couple minutes about from a therapist perspective 
what went well and what didn't. So in my opinion, self-managed care was an asset to many of our clients. Uh, it provided support for the client as well as the families uh, to continue to provide a living, but also to care for their loved one. Uh, being cognizant that that's not available to reserve clients uh, via AHS funding. So that's a different process and you have to, it goes reserve by reserve. Um, also, if it's WCB, they actually do have a self-managed care program that a therapist can access and work with their WCB um, uh, coordinator or, or liaison person. So we can work with them as well for that. Uh, renovations, a lot weren't completed properly. So that really left a lot of our clients and families further frustrated with the process. Finances were a huge issue that impeded either fixing them or doing it properly in the first place or getting to what we were hoping to achieve for, for our clients. So just keeping that in mind, and I already touched on it, funding's just not, it's not there. Um, and then I wanted to go back and just touch on transportation because I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't really elaborate much on it. So a lot of communities don't even have handy buses. So that's another issue. If they do have a handy bus, especially in a small community, they don't run seven days a week and they're like an eight to four o'clock bus run. So that's very limiting. Um, and they don't service all the outlying communities. So it might service in town, but it doesn't necessarily hit your out of town acreage individuals. So keeping that in mind as well. So that again, left further expenses to families and the client to either modify their vehicles, buy a new vehicle. So again, that was something to factor in to ensure that the client, once they got home, actually had a way to leave their home in, in the sense of transportation. Um, so I just want to touch on those ones. Uh, so in my, as a therapist, what I would say would be an ideal transition uh, would be first, I think the self-managed care is a huge piece. It, if it can be, set it up prior to discharge. Um, having all the renovations completed before the client's discharge, I think is huge as well. It's not always, it doesn't always happen that way, but it, it would be the optimal situation. And I really feel that having that opportunity to go back and forth with the client a couple of times as a therapist is optimal as well. And getting to see the environment the client is going back to and coming back to a safe environment like the hospital that is more modified. As Keisha said, it's more modified, but at least we can trial it. We have the mats, we have the gym mats we can put down. Like we have different ways to modify things in the hospital to mimic home. Uh, so those would be ideas that I think in an optimal world that piece would fall in, right? Um, and then having earlier access to clients' homes prior to discharge would also be optimal. So those are just a couple things that I've noticed in the years. That's a lot, Ashton. Um, again, that resonates with me a lot as well. Um, you know, having worked the bulk of my career in rural practice and encountering similar things. Um, you know, if I try to sum it up, which I often do, it sounds like, you know, time, planning, and communication. Maybe communication comes first. Time, communication, and planning. If we can have those things at our disposal, that really allows for the ideal circumstance. But it's usually a breakdown in, in one of those things. And I think both of your examples have spoken to that, whether it was just not good communication between a rehab site and a small rural community site where, where the, the client is, is moving back to, um, or, or just not having you know, enough time to get things done, or you had time to do it the first time, but heaven forbid there's a mistake, and now we don't have enough time to redo it or fix it. Um, and then I think all that comes together, just sort of a lack of planning. Um, you know, where I think this is really relevant in a rural setting that, that really sets it apart from a, you know, our larger cities is we have less flexibility in, in trying to make up for not having enough time or um, where things do break down, right? Uh, and the thing that comes to mind, Ashton, you mentioned the handy bus, and I just thought of this when, when I uh, lived and worked in Smoky Lake, a small town right northeast of Edmonton. Um, you know, we did have a bus. It was run by a, a local nonprofit group. Um, but, so there was one bus, but there were like two people who could drive it, right? Um, you know, and 
if you you know you're familiar with living in small towns, often these volunteer groups are run and administered by people that have their own needs, right? Like in our circumstance, it was you know with two people that were we relied on to drive the bus. They were older, right? So oftentimes they were dealing with their own stuff and not available. So it'd be very challenging for someone to, you know, be dependent on that as a method of transportation. Great service when it worked, but lots of times where it just didn't. Um, okay, so before we kind of move on into the next phase of this, which will be some smaller group discussion, um, I just kind of like to throw it back to you two and, and just see, do you guys have some questions for each other now that you've, you've heard a little bit more from each other? Yeah, I got one for Ashton. Um, so when I was going through all that emotional and psychological uh, difficulties, I didn't really have any resources or didn't even know where to start. So do you have any resources that you are able to look into? So from my perspective, we were just as frustrated and lack of ish with the lack of resources. And I, I touch on it briefly, but Jason elaborated. We don't have proper social work support. We don't have proper mental health supports. Uh, so that was also another barrier that I saw for clients. It wasn't really a strength by any stretch. Um, having been, I can only speak to La Clubish area, but we didn't have enough population to actually start proper support groups. We had approached the county about starting like a family support group or a client support group, but we didn't have enough of any client diagnosis to actually start proper groups. So we had thought about an MS group um, spinal cord injury group, you know, and we just didn't have the clients to even attend these groups. Um, so that was, again, another, another barrier that we saw. Um, but focusing on a positive, I do think that this is amazing that this is now going viral. Um, and that this is a resource that the therapist as well as clients can now attend, come to. There's Q and A's after, I think this is a great networking opportunity. And I think we're gonna see a lot more growth in this area. So I think moving ahead, this is a huge asset. Um, but no, in Lackwish, we didn't have a lot. So it was, un it was unfortunate for sure. And I guess throwing that back at you, Keisha, what do you feel would have been helpful? So in the very beginning, when I was injured, I had never even heard I didn't even know what a quadriplegic was. So me and mom quickly went to YouTube and literally searched what it was, what we can do and all that. And that's when I found a couple girls and I started following them and seeing what I was, what my future looked like. So in the same sense, I started doing that too. And so that I can give that for the next people, but, and that helped me in the beginning, that was everything I needed. Then this year, only because of COVID, um, we, uh, the spinal cord injury people started a wheelie girl support group. And in the very beginning, that would not have helped me. Um, I was in denial that this injury was permanent. Why would I want to be together with other people that, um, I have nothing in common with, but let me tell you that has honestly saved my life this year. Like with everything going on with not being able to socialize, um, so basically what it is, is it's a bunch of girls with spinal cord injuries, different levels, different age groups, different um, accident stories that come together and just have a community. We talk about everything and anything and everything that we've gone through, they've gone through everything that we're going to go through, they've gone through. So if we have questions of like, when I, when I want to have kids in the future, there's people in there that have had kids. I didn't even think that was possible at one point. So like this and like when you're in your lowest moments and your scariest moments going through all these physical changes and everything, these girls have already been through it. These girls have all the advice for you. They have your back, even if they haven't, like that is everything and anything. And I think no matter what you go through to have a support group, to just know that you're not alone is absolutely incredible and life-changing. So that, that is what I think this world needs. And I think, like you said, Ashton, these webinars are going to hit these rural people. They're going to have that resource to go through all this. And yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you. I'm hoping moving forward that there's going to be more of these groups coming, like emerging. 
because uh, it will definitely help us as therapists as well to facilitate that process, right? When we have clients and they ask, then we can actually reach out to these groups. So I think that's great. The more, the more and more we find out about these groups, the better. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Is, is there anything else you wanted to ask each other before we move on? I'm good. Thank you. Maybe just one more, Ashton. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the self-managed care? Because that's really, really important. So what part about it? Like, how do you access it or which part? The value of it versus oh. home care. So I, I'll speak to self-managed care briefly. Um, I sit on the panel for self-managed care and it's, it's quite a process. And basically it's able it's once you've maxed out home care services in that area. Now, every area is different again. <laughs> uh, so Lacklevish is now just offering evenings and weekend home care supports. A couple of years ago, that wasn't an option. So we saw a lot more clients go on to self-managed care because we only had eight to four Monday to Friday support. So self-managed care, the idea is, is it's a... Um, a partnership, I guess would be the best word to say, between AHS and the client. And knowing that the family is still going to be doing a large part of the care needs and the support, but AHS has this program that, that's called self-managed care that they will, based on your assessed needs, provide a certain amount of funding. And in that case, then the client, so let's say Keisha was on self-managed care, Keisha would now have so many hours assigned to you um, based on the assessments and then you would hire and fire so you'd run like a small business if that makes sense and you would have the ability to hire your caregivers make their schedules so you go to school and work so you would be able to accommodate um, when you need that time rather than having home care who only work certain hours it's again limited and we all know that it can get canceled at times so if someone calls in sick or they don't have enough room to add more clients then you're on a wait list to access home care services so self-managed care is that bridging process and it is more hours obviously than what home care can provide so it's the idea is is to keep clients at home and in their environments with their families or where they choose to be uh, rather than being in facility does that make sense did I hit on it? Okay. And that those programs are through um, home care. So home care does the assessment. Some areas, the OT does a lot of it. And other areas, it's more RN driven. And uh, you need to do an assessment and application to the panel. And then um, the panel decides if you qualify for self-managed care or not, and then how much, and then the, the contract starts. So it's a contract. Excuse me. Thank you very much, you guys. Um, again, really good discussion. And, and I think definitely some things to help spark conversation in, in our breakout rooms, which is coming right up. Um, you know, I, I just want to say, like, I, I really agree with some of the points you made, Keisha, about, you know, um, a lot of these virtual resources or virtual platforms opening up access to resources in terms of supporting people uh, mentally. And, and emotionally, and, and so that, that's really great. And that is one thing that we've seen really um, expand over this past year. Uh, and I would say on a provider side of it, we've had a similar experience, right? I, I think we've, we've been working the past several years, you know, as a physiotherapist, um, trying really hard uh, to better connect our own physiotherapists with other experts within the organization, right? One of the things we talked about earlier was you know, someone going back to a small rural community where maybe that physiotherapist, and I'm just saying that because that's what I am, um, you know, they, they haven't really worked a lot with spinal cord injury. So they, they know a little bit, but not enough to really give you what you need. Um, well, we have, we've been developing resources to get that physiotherapist connected with someone else within in the province that does have that expertise, right? And, you know, those, those resources and, um, platforms have been building slowly, but definitely this past year, it's, it's really exploded. So I think we're much better connected now than we were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. But there's still a ways to go. Um, but but I'm, I'm happy to see that we've, we've gotten this push. 
Uh, so again, thank you very much. Uh, we're about to go into our breakout rooms where, where people can you know, ask some of the questions. You know, feel free. I, I've seen some good questions in the chat box. Uh, please take those to our breakout rooms and but also share your own stories. I, I hope what you've heard has kind of sparked um, some thoughts on what you've experienced. Before we jump in there though, um, let's just go through our final poll questions. Uh, so similar to what we saw at the beginning, uh, we'll have several poll questions appear on your screen. Uh, please just select the most appropriate answer. One more. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so we'll go into our breakout room. So it'll be three of them, uh, one with me, one with Ashton, and one with Melissa. Uh, so if you're prompted on the screen, just please select, uh, click on the, the prompt to enter the breakout room. Boom, we're all back. Hi, Jason. Guy got cut off right in the middle of, a, I think, a really important question. Are we able to just circle back to that quickly? Yeah, yeah. This Sorry. That thing up and then let's let's go to that right away. Just prompt me to, to do that. Okay. Sorry. Um, excuse me. Uh, sorry, guys, bear with me. I'm just going to throw my screen back up here. Um, okay, so we're, we'll, we'll just, before we jump into our larger group discussion, I just want to um, bring everyone back to our evaluation. Okay, so in the chat box, you'll see posted the link to access this evaluation. Uh, you don't have to do it right now, but I would invite everyone to at least open the link right now. Um, and then when the session is done, it'll be open, right? You can do it at the end. You can do it during the discussion. If you just want to get it done right now, then, then do it right now. But uh, if you're like me, sometimes at the end of a session, I just close my windows as quickly as possible, um, especially because I haven't eaten lunch yet. So I'll be definitely closing my windows quickly. Um, but if you, yeah, open it up now and uh, then you can complete it at your leisure. And if you do, uh, again, your name will be entered in the draw uh, for that iPad. Okay. Um, I also want to make mention of a few things here. Um, a few avenues to follow Spinal Cord Injury Alberta on social media. 
You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, at SCI Alberta, uh, as well as Twitter, at SCI Alberta, and on YouTube. And like I said, these sessions themselves are recorded and posted on the SCI Alberta YouTube page. Um, and a reminder to everyone, next Monday, same time, uh, there will be a post-chat, uh, post-webinar chat hosted by uh, our peers uh, from Spinal Cord Injury Alberta, that is Steve and Terry, if you've attended the past sessions. Um, everyone is welcome to join. Uh, people living in the community with spinal cord injury, their family members, uh, healthcare providers, uh, we're, we're all welcome. Uh, and it's just a, a chance to carry on the conversation, bring up other ideas. Uh, maybe after a few days of thinking about it, more questions come to mind. Uh, so it's a chance for everyone to come back together uh, and, and have some, some more discussion. Okay, so with that, we'll move to our uh, discussion. And so uh, Ashton, uh, you wanted to... Yeah, sorry. Um, our breakout session, Guy was just posing a really valuable question. I just want to give him the opportunity to, I guess, start it over. Sorry. Thank you, Ashton. Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Guy, and I work with Spinal Cord Injury Alberta. Uh, I'm a lifer there, 30 plus years. Seeing the transition over time of rehab being shorter and shorter, the beds, um, Alberta Health Services counting the days that each person's in a bed, budgets being tighter, et cetera, but people being discharged um, from, let's say, the University of Royal Alex back into the rural community that like Keisha was talking about uh, when nobody knows what's going on. They don't have the resources person's health is deteriorating and waiting for a bed at the Glen Rose. Um, we've got concentric program or project going. We've got the uh, Alberta spinal cord injury strategy, but nowhere is there a push to say this is not optimal health. And it should be the, in my mind, the forefront of a push to go, this is not acceptable. You, the Royal Alex University, you're not sending people back to a rural hospital. It's not serving them well, and it's unacceptable. And you just have to wait for a bed. Uh, the number of beds in rehab has shrunken over the years. Again, no pushback from the spinal cord injury community. And as a whole, I'm talking groups like this with all the partners to say, Alberta Health Services, this is not acceptable. We need more beds. So what as a community can we do about it? How can we build that into existing strategies so it doesn't happen to people like Keisha and others coming down the line? That's just my view. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Guy. Uh, Well-informed and very accurate words. Um, I, I see a lot of nodding, so I, I think that that is resonating with people. Um, and, you know, it resonates with me too, uh, having worked as a, as a rural therapist and you know, and if I'm being very honest, you know, it, it, it could be frustrating at times to have a client sent to my facility and feeling unprepared to support the client, right? Knowing full well, I don't have what they need, um, but, but knowing what I could have, right? Um, if I had just had a conversation with someone earlier on, you know, I, I, had, I would have maybe had capacity to make arrangements, to make plans, to secure whether it was equipment or space, or even just my time, depending on what that person needs. And, you know, I, I would say, I've seen some steps taken in the right direction there, far from being where we should be, absolutely. Um, but even just as simple as, if, if you're the, the Glen Rose or anywhere else, 
and you want to send a patient to this site, you know, talk to the people at that site to find out. Don't make assumptions about what's there and what's going to be available. Um, you know, does the site have an OT? And you find out yes. Like, that's not really enough information. You need to know, is that OT working in acute care where this client is going to be sent? Um, is this client, is this OT prepared with the knowledge that this person is going to need? Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to take over, but um, I think your comments are much bigger than that um, and more important. And, and I think you're right. The, the, the community is the one that has to make the push. Um, any, any responses to that? It's a little quiet there, Vito. Oh, again. Sorry. Maybe here. Can you hear me better? I don't know where the, the volume of my machine is. Here right. is better. Better so, whatever you're doing. Okay. So sorry guys for uh, I'm Beto. I'm a physiatrist working at the Glen Rose Benham Hospital at the Spanish Renewal Program. And I'm also part, I'm also part of the concentric project that he was referring to. Uh, I have I, 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 thank you. This this session has been very, very uh, enlightening for me. And I just want to make a reflection because I hear two things here in the in the breakout room. So firstly, you're saying there is also an issue between people in, in acute care being sent to their home hospitals to wait for inpatient rehab. That will be the foothills or the clinic, right? So that is a big piece. And in concentric, we are not focusing on that one. And it's, for me, it's very, very uh, interesting hearing that here because I think may, maybe we should we should do something about it. For those of you that do not know what Concentric is, Concentric is a research project in which we're trying to understand what are the needs to improve the transitions of care of people with spinal cord injury in the province, specifically to rural areas. So we have two main sites. One is uh, Slave Lake. And the other one is let, the left bridge area. So right now we are trying to understand that through some interviews that we conducted, and we are putting together a team of people. And of course, the, this invitation is open to all of you guys in here to be part of that team, so we can brainstorm together those solutions. And one of those examples is keep bringing that voice into the table because I can tell you, in the I'm part of the kind of the steering committee of that project, and that that. That, uh, as a clinician, I totally agree with you. That's a big issue when you send people from acute care to wait for inpatient rehab without any guidance. And Ashton, you said it beautifully in the, in the breakout room, like uh, you don't like when you get a, a client and the client comes without any guidance or any, uh, none of the, of the even equipment sorted out, right? So that's a big gap that we have in the system that is unacceptable, as you put it that way, key. So maybe we need to, to do something about it. And the other aspect is, uh, Ashton, what you said, uh, uh, it's not only a matter of having that person, because right as you said, you, you said like, is there any, what's that question of, is there any kind of expert in SEI who can be connected with the, with all the, the providers in, the, in these rural areas so, so they can provide that support? And, and then your, your answer, Ashton, was really interesting. You said, it's not only about connecting and telling me, hey, this is what you can do. It's also about the manpower, well, sorry, man, women power, right? So I, I wonder if, if you can comment further because for, for us and for Concentric, that will be a huge part because right now we are relying in maybe as a solution, building that, that figure, that brand issue come out very logically. Hey, Let's, if the problem is a specialized knowledge, let's, let's, let's work on that. Let's put someone who can provide that, that communication, but apparently that won't be enough. So I, I wonder if this is also touching on the, on the concept of building really real relationships, building teams, knowing each other, not just a person that is there when you need it. Hey, I have a question, technical question about this and goodbye, right? So I don't know, what do you guys think? If I chime in just quickly, um, just kind of going on that bit on kind of what you guys are saying, like, uh, I think Keisha made a comment earlier, you know, they go out and their, their PT and OT or whoever they're working with is going online and looking at YouTube videos to learn about what to do to help them. Well, why are they going and searching for random videos 
when there's a community like us, like even our webinar series here, this skills community that we're trying to build here could be a great resource for that rural physical therapist or occupational therapist or parent who can, or, or person with spinal cord injury. Okay, so I'm going to go to a rural community. Here's my resources. And we have, you know, whether it's videos, people that, that they can talk to, peers that they can talk to, not only with spinal cord injury, but without, you know, because they should be accessing people in the know, not looking for it outside of Alberta. Um, is So I think there, yeah, it just makes sense. But obviously, yeah, there's obviously a lot of reasons why it hasn't happened yet, but hopefully with the virtual age that we kind of got going here, something can change in that direction. Anyone else want to comment or respond to that? I think a lot of it is around um, comfort level. So I know in my situation, Lack of which was considered a higher risk for spinal cord injuries. Um, we were on a first name basis with the girls in our transfers. So I got to know who to call when I needed supports in what area. Um, but I didn't have assistants that were even willing to facilitate the process or work with me. And there was no physio half the time. So as everyone knows, it's not a one person. You can't put a paraplegic on the floor on a mat and try to teach them how to transfer without other supports like it's it's not actually physically possible so I think it's a little bit bigger than just having having a peer to reach out to is extremely important but there's other pieces that are missing and equipment is a huge thing in some of our settings like our gyms aren't properly we don't even have an Argo uh, proper Argo walker in Lacklebush uh, when Edmonton you put them on and you, the platforms, <laughs> we don't have any of that. We don't have any of it. So when we are talking with the Glen Rose and they're giving us advice on what to do with some of our clients, we were still rolling out the, um, the table where we would strap people down and the standing table. That's what we had. That's all we had. So, and that ended up getting surplused. So that was taken away from us because it wasn't um, standard practice anymore, right? So for some of our rural settings, and um, it's where does the where does it come from? Where does the money come from to buy the equipment? I think it's it's a little bit bigger. Um, in saying that, I'm not saying that we it's okay. It's just how how do we support each other in that? Um, and sometimes, and I don't want to jade anyone, but sometimes when we reach out to Edmonton. They're not that receptive and we don't actually get a lot of support. Um, when I've tried to stall discharges, I've been told that it's our problem, right? And, and that's fair. <laughs> but when you're only one person and they have, I, I've worked in Edmonton, when they have a ton of peers and supports, it, it's hard when you're being told by Edmonton that you have to take that client home. This is where their address is. This is where they need to go. And I understand that. But if that was my loved one, I would be royally upset. I'm upset as a therapist and I'd be further upset if I was family, right? Then I'll go change my postal code. <laughs> so I, I think it's a little bit bigger and it, it's just hard. How do you set up every single rural setting to have the proper equipment? Because we're not just talking spinal cord. This goes into stroke. This goes into MS, ALS. It goes into so many other diagnoses as well. And the stuff doesn't always cross over and neither does the skill set. So it, it is a hard conversation. Um, and retention is an issue sometimes in the North Zone as well. So you just bump up your, your area and your expertise and you lose that expert, we'll say. So I, I think it's, uh, Jason, you should probably speak to this more, but I think it's a very multi faceted issue in the north zone and i would assume central and um yeah south zone as well but that's that's my experience or my thoughts on it and you know what jason before you go there one of the things that for me is very representative here in the chat books so look at that please read that comment from Brittany right early on and she said i went to peace river zero support and when she got her independence, when she moved to Edmonton, and that for me is kind of a lighter. So 
So is, does that mean that it's still the case? Like if someone goes to a rural area, they're not going to reach out to the, to the independents. Do you think that's happening right now? Yeah. And yes. We, yeah. If there are people out there that are, have experienced that, then I definitely want to hear that. But, well, it's not but. Um, I, I would say, yes, it is happening. Or at the very least, it, it's, and I think in some cases it's happening necessarily because of, of a sincere lack of resource and a real, real lack of connectedness. Um, and I think in some cases it's happening unnecessarily um, because of a lack of connectedness, right? Um, I think there are situations where, uh, and I think this happens in the city too, bigger cities too. Um, and this kind of came up in our smaller group um, where someone ends up at home or they, they finally get home um, if they haven't been set up with the right expectations about, well, once you get home and get settled, you're still going to need this, this, and this. And to get those things, this is how you should, this is how it should happen. Um, if you don't know that, then how do you even know to ask? How do you even know to expect or to know that something is not happening the way it's supposed to be, right? Um, and, and, and so I think when we talk about people falling through the cracks, I think that's often why we haven't set people up with expectations we're, we're just talking about getting to the next point and then at that point someone's going to magically come in and carry you to the next point it doesn't work that way you know it just doesn't um, and i think we have examples where we do a better job but i think there's still lots of examples where it's still not happening yeah like if working together to make a rural like you said a rural package whether it's equipment or um, uh, knowledge, you know, and through all of it, you can Alberta Health or Spinal Cord Injury Alberta. Like we deal with clients all over Alberta as well. So if we're like, hey, you live in this rural town, this is what, here's our list. This is your list. If that, and that's like day one of talking to a new client in a rural setting. That also, yeah, that also that also engages like a bit, but you're with the conversation that is happening right now, right? Being like a sort of representative of a, a community organization is already jumping on and saying, hey, we have something for people like for therapists uh, uh, to, to train them on what we do. So I was thinking, uh, I, and the other comment, we need to think outside the box. Yes, because uh, Ashton, you put it beautifully, we don't have enough capacity, we don't have enough personnel so what are we going to do? Are we going to wait until the government invests more money in that personnel within Alberta services? Or we need to be creative and connect with other resources that are outside of Alberta services to do a job and to do a better job. But again, for me, the key is being a team, communicate with each other and understand what we do. Because if we just kind of do our things separately, uh, but I don't think the... the the result is going to be a soft team with us. Right? Um, personally, I think that's why it's so important when you are at the Glen Rose to see as many people with spinal cord injuries that look like you, that live near you, that you can see what their setup looks like, what you should be expected to do when you go home, what somebody living with like successfully, like as independently as possible looks like before you go home. Because I didn't have any, I, like I, I was the same that Jason just said, I didn't even know what I wasn't getting. Like, I just was like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. And then when I came to Edmonton, I was like, nope, not how I'm supposed to be living. Not at all how I'm supposed to be living. And so that's why I think, yeah, like peer, these peer things are gold. And like Keisha said, the, just having a support group, like, yes, it only goes so far, but at least if the person knows what they're not getting, they can advocate for themselves because the healthcare professionals they, nobody listens to you guys as much as they listen to us. Like, I wish they did, but they don't. Uh, and if we know what we're supposed to be getting and we say, this isn't right, um, then we can get it. I think we have more leverage. But if we don't know what we don't know, then we don't know what to advocate for. Well, then you guys are the most important piece and the only piece that is always there. <laughs> you're, like, you're, you're the one consistent thing. If anyone's informed, it, it really should be you. Um, yes. No one else should have more knowledge of the journey or the experience than you. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think 
better to help inform that than someone who's gone through it. Um, and I've, it's I've, a little sad with COVID because the Glen Rose, like, obviously has to, but like the amount of peer interaction is so limited right now um, that people aren't aren't seeing what they need to see um, about how they should be able to live and what they should be expecting from their new life. So, which is sad, but it's I don't know I don't know what the solution is. It's just difficult. I just well, thought of something. Okay, go Brenda. Go Brenda. Brenda. Um, I just thought of something, Brittany, because I was thinking back to Keisha before when she was talking about her home renovation and how it didn't, in the end, really work out the best for her. And there are so many um, of us out there in wheelchairs that have done different modifications to our houses in different ways. And it would be so great if the hospital OTs would be able to use that as a resource for people. And the amount of people in wheelchairs that would be willing to have an OT come to their house to say, hey, I want to show you what I have so you can help your patients. I'm sure there's so many of us that would do that. And it would make such a difference, just unnecessary costs too. I had, uh, that was the example I gave last week is I had one client that he was a guru on everything. So he was my resource. If I needed something, I called him. <laughs> That's perfect. I think we all do find uh, both clients that inspire us and constantly advocate. Uh, he was really good too, because I could give his number out to other clients, like he would consent to that. But again, it's finding those resources that is typically an obstacle uh, to start with. Yeah, and honestly, um, if you were to ask Spinal Cord Injury Alberta, one of our peer coordinators, um, I'm sure that we could find someone if you were looking for something specific. I think we could definitely help with that as well. Yeah, that's definitely something like we get people could call us for peer mentorship, but we don't get a lot of as much from an OT being like, you should contact, you know, the OTs leading it or something like that. You should contact peer, uh, uh, Spinal Cord Injury Alberta because they have peer coordinators and they could help you find these resources. You know, it, um, it's not just mentorship. It's those little things, like you said, where little things people did to make it so they could do stuff. That that's that right there is one of the biggest helps. And I think thinking outside the box is really going to help people with that. Like, I think we get really sort of like one track minded, and we think this is the only way we can do things. But I think if you think outside the box and like just, you know, ask yourself if I was in this position, what would I do? Right? Because that's how a lot of things, that's how a lot of us have uh, adapted our houses and adapted our vehicles and stuff is just by being creative and like what works for me. So I think there's a lot of power in just, you know, trying to get yourself out of those boxes. Either that or we've messed up our houses. <laughs> So we know what not to do. We might not know what to do with your house, but we know what not to do. So this is something we talked about before and I, I kind of brought up in Concentric as well as having like Spawn Quit Injury Alberta, for example, being a lot more involved with Alberta Health. You know, so that transition from hospital to house doesn't have to be rural, but rural setting, for example. Um, like we be the ones to take on the person. And we're also the connection to Alberta Health. So while they need something more still from Alberta Health, we're that, you know, we're that web that connects everybody, you know? Um, Cause I think that's the issue too, is people just can't access. They don't know where to start. And we should be a lot more. Terry, I think you're gonna maybe, I'm hoping you're gonna have lots of calls next week. Cause I, we're circulating your email or your, um... YouTube page and everything very um, quite a bit across the north. <laughs> awesome. Honestly, I didn't really know until you guys asked me to join a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know anything about you. So I think you're a huge resource and you will have OTs beating down your door. So be warned. <laughs> Perfect. I'm South Zone. So no sweat off my back. Okay. Go, go Steve. <laughs> go Steve. So um, this is Mika from Grand Prairie region, and I'm still ho holding a community development role in this region. And um, 
There's a lot of stuff that I've been hearing today that we've been able to implement since people were injured. And the most recent one is that there is somebody in, um, in our area who is excited about small contracts such as building additions to homes that are wheelchair accessible. And so um, it's, there's so much that happens from one year to the next as the needs of our client base changes and as the needs of the communities change, um, it's really very, very exciting. And um, I do encourage people to contact um, whoever is in your area. Um, if, if you don't have Steve's name, then you can have mine if you're in the North, right? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, that, that does fall on us, I think, now. Um, and, and some of that is, like the comment of, of thinking outside the box. Um, <clears throat> we, we get used to processes and, and steps and check boxes. And as long as we do these things in these order, you know, I've done my job. Um, but, you know, clearly what I'm, what I'm learning is we can put in other steps, right? We can, we can put in other things and, you know, finding ways to offer this connection to our clients as a first step, not waiting until someone's desperate and you're like, oh, well, maybe we'll try this now. Um, you know, we can be a lot more proactive and say like, hey, you know, you, you seem like you're in a good spot. What better time than to think about these other things rather than waiting till you're in distress and kind of grasping at straws. And, and it's not limited to spinal cord injury. Like we, we can talk about that with lots of populations, but here we are with a, a great network and resource right in front of us. And from what I'm hearing, a lot of willing participants to support other people. Uh, so yeah, I think it, it does fall on us. Uh, it falls on the community to be stepping up and, and offering that support and, and then actually delivering. Um, but it falls on us as healthcare providers to connect our clients uh, with all of you as a resource. Awesome, I'm seeing time is up, tick down. Yeah. Right, go ahead, is there anything else before we close off? No, I think we're gonna get booted. So yes, uh, if you guys wanna join the chat next week, please, Steve and I will be there. Uh, and please fill out that link if you guys uh, wanna do that, that helps and hopefully you win an iPad or, or tablet is what we call it. But um, I'm super excited to see you guys next week. So please, please jump in again. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate the discussion today. I, I feel like it was, it was definitely worth my time and, and attention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. See you. Thank you, everyone.